Welcome to The Indigenous Approach, a podcast where we examine the role of the nation's premier partnership force across the competition continuum, from cooperation to conflict and everything in between. In this episode, seven sergeants major from across the Special Forces Regiment discuss what is the Special Forces identity and if there is a Special Forces identity crisis. Welcome to this episode of The Indigenous Approach. I'm Jacob Brayman, and I have the pleasure of being the host for today's podcast. This episode is the beginning of a three-part series discussing the Special Forces identity. We will discuss what is the SF identity, is there an SF identity crisis, how does this affect the force, and what steps are needed to address the issue. We have the pleasure of having an esteemed group of sergeants major from across the Special Forces Regiment. We have Sergeant Major Dave Friedberg, the Alpha Company 4th Battalion 1st Special Forces Group Sergeant Major. Dave joined Special Forces in 1999 and is an original regional support element plank holder. He has multiple deployments to the Indo-PACOM AOR and believes patients should be a warfighting function. Glad to be here, Jake. Command Sergeant Major retired Jeffrey Wright. Jeff served in three different Special Forces groups and as a senior enlisted leader for four joint commands. He served in the Army from the Cold War to the Gulf War and to the Global War on Terror and many points in between. Good morning, everybody. This is Jeff Wright from sunny Sanford, North Carolina. Sergeant Major Matt Williams, the 2nd Battalion, 3rd Special Forces Group Operations Sergeant Major. Matt joined under the 18 X-ray program in 2005. He has deployed to Afghanistan and Africa many times and was also an instructor at Safartec. Sergeant Major Williams was awarded the Medal of Honor in 2019 for his actions during the Battle of Shock Valley in Afghanistan in 2008. Hey, thanks Thanks for having me, Jake. Glad to be here. Command Sergeant Major retired Bill Thetford, the United States Army Special Operations Command Operations Integrator. Bill joined Special Forces in 1993 and retired in March of 2019. Most of his experience comes from CENTCOM and SOCOM. Good morning, Jacob, and uh, hello to my Hello, Special Forces teammates out there. Good to see everybody. Command Sergeant Major Dave Waldo, the Command Sergeant Major of 4th Battalion, 1st Special Warfare Training Group. He joined Special Forces in 2001 and started his SF career in 1st Special Forces Group. He now works to mold the newest generations of Green Berets. Truly honored to be here, Jay. Thank you. Command Sergeant Major retired Terry Peters. Terry entered the Army in 1983 and retired as the 3rd Special Forces Group Command Sergeant Major with 27 years in the Army. Since retiring in early 2010, Terry has served the SF community in an advisory role to many leaders and contributes to numerous charities which help SF veterans and their families. He currently serves as the Honorary Command Sergeant Major of the Regiment. Hey, good morning, Jake. It's great to be here and Command Sergeant Major retired Tom Smith. Tom spent 35 years in Special Forces from 1977 to 2012. He served over eight years in SWIC teaching SEER and in the SF pipeline. He served as the U.S. SOCOM Command Sergeant Major for five years and nine months. As the U.S. SOCOM Command Sergeant Major, he created the Joint Special Operations Forces Senior Enlisted Academy. After retirement, he created the Summit course in the Soft Enlisted Academy and continues to teach and mentor to this day. Thank you, uh, Jacob. Very happy to be here. Much of the question on the Special Forces identity came from a study conducted by the 1st Special Forces Command Chief of Staff, Colonel Ed Crute. His research used surveys to determine what the force felt was the SF identity. Using all the data collected, the findings pointed to there being an identity crisis. There are links to the paper and a couple other discussions on the topic in the show notes. With all that being said, gentlemen, what is the SF identity and is there an SF identity crisis? I think the SF identity has been, is, and will always be. People that have come over from the conventional army or come in off of the street to be Green Berets, they've got that combat arms mentality, but everything has to be focused towards finding somebody to partner with and to do force multiplication. You, you, you can have temporary immediate tactical effects if you're just leading 10 or 15 people onto the X with tons and tons of close air support. But if we are gonna win the wars and win the competition space being at, we're being asked to win, we have to develop sustainable indigenous partners 
they can do what we're training them to do without us being around there, right? We provide them a little bit of logistical support, whatever, whatever the different OAI may be, but we have to get it back into our heads that we haven't succeeded unless we leave the country, leaving behind a group of people that can train themselves, that can sustain themselves, that can learn and grow without us being there with them. That's my personal opinion. Yeah, great comments, Dave. Everyone, Dave Waldo, I'll tell you, a few years ago, I got to go with a group of battalion leadership to Jimmy John's headquarters. It's one of those knowledge exchanges, best practices. And we walked into this billion dollar enterprise and the outside was a pretty normal looking building, but we go through and inside you could tell that people absolutely adored and believed in what they were doing there. We walked through the, the catacombs of this place. We go to this big fancy office with big comfy chairs and in, in walks Jimmy Johns himself, you know, Jimmy Latal, he's a larger life guy. And he sits down in the chair and he says, well, fellas, we make sandwiches, what do you do? And I'll tell you, all of us had a different answer. Now, certainly there's a little bit of a nuance between a corner sandwich shop and a, and a billion dollar national brand, but that clarity and purpose truly had a profound impact on me. So are, are we as soft able to succinctly explain our purpose outside of platitudes? Probably not. So the question is, do we have an identity crisis? I would say yes, but then I would quickly say that's why we exist. You know, we're, we're born out of a crisis. We can all trace our roots to the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS. You know, they were purpose built and they lasted for three years. U.S. Army Special Forces were built in 1952 as a lasting and enduring capability to work under the threshold of, of large scale intense conflict, you know, to excel in those gray areas, decentralized manners where very little can can go right but a whole lot can go wrong but one constant in our identity though in president kennedy said it so said it best is a green beret is a symbol of excellence a badge of courage and a market distinction and the green beret has been trusted over the last two decades now to, to quarterback us through this, this global war on terrorism and now we're going to be entrusted to play a critical role as we compete for influence and presence in key areas throughout this this very strange global great power competition by dominating, you know, by, with, and through our indigenous partners. So with our eight core competencies, I don't think we'll ever have the luxury of, of having a singular or defined identity, other than identity is one of, of constant adaptability to meet the challenges of our adversaries or enemies. So do we have an identity crisis? Absolutely, and I don't think we'd have it any other way. So our Major Williams, what are your thoughts? I think so, yeah, and I actually think, uh, Sergeant Major Waldo, uh, make some excellent points there. Um, but I, I want to start off with uh, ensuring we kind of are all in, have a shared understanding of, of the definition of identity crisis in this, in this discussion. Uh, and, and this is pulling directly from Colonel Cruz's paper, as you mentioned earlier. So uh, he has identity crisis is defined as a period of uncertainty and confusion in which a person's or group's sense of identity becomes insecure, typically due to a change in their expected aims or role in society. Um, and, and utilizing that definition in this aspect, does SF have an identity crisis? <clears throat> I would say, you know, as, as Dave mentioned previously, yes, we do. Um, you know, we've been pulled into, and, and as he, to use his words, quarterback the global war on terrorism for the past almost 20 years and, and done an excellent job. And, you know, there's accolades to be said for it. Um, guys have gone out there, served their country, done wonderful things and moved on. And now we find ourselves into a strategic level shift of focus. Um, and that always comes with, as the definition states, um, uncertainty and a change. Um, and it's where do we go from here? How do we approach this change? And how do we tailor our message to, the, to our new recruits, to the guys we already have serving for us and our leaders as to what that change is how to, and, and how do we um, operate within that change? Um, and that's where we lie right now. And that's kind of where this identity crisis comes into play. Um, and, and the approach to handle identity crisis is, is going to be hard fought, I think, um, because we've gotten used to and we've built a force that understands one certain way of life. And that is, um, you know, while we use indigenous pros in places like Iraq, Afghanistan, et cetera, um, we are kind of the ones that are kind of up front, leading the charge, doing the door kicking. And, and we're strategically shifting away from that and trying to find effects in different manners of, of operations all within our core competencies, but it just looks different. Um, and that different look is the hard sell currently. And that's what, what I would consider what, you know, the identity crisis consists of. You know, I think I can contribute to our discussion this morning from my observations uh, at 
uh, SOCOM and CENTCOM as a senior enlisted leader from 2014 to 2019, where you know I had the opportunity to look at the, not just the SF regiment, but really the soft community from the strategic level. And I'll tell you, I, I first think that uh, Colonel Crute's research is, you know, is is accurate. It's kind of it really says a lot that we are. We, we are a force as a whole that is kind of drawn to direct action. Um, and the Special Forces Regiment is, is not alone in that. I would tell you, many of the soft elements that I uh, uh, talked to and, and observed during those five years, that had the same kind of gravitation to doing uh, direct action. And, and I think that's actually expected. And, and I'm not, not surprised at uh, Colonel Crute's research or his findings, because we were um, kind of put into this uh, uh, continued uh, almost two decades of conflict with violent extremist organizations, uh, largely in the CENTCOM region and, and some in, in AFRICOM. And that's just, we were a product of our environment where we in SOFT were kind of, it was a, you know, kind of a, a call to arms that we had to do direct action missions as a tool to, to fight violent extremist organizations. And so we, we let some of our other core skills kind of atrophy, where we didn't uh, we didn't have a lot of time uh, between deployments to do some of the other uh, core skills or environmental training and those other types of things that in normal um, environments in normal times we we would have had the opportunity to do those things. And so, you know, while I think special forces may have an identity crisis in that they are drawn to direct action, they are not alone, and I don't fault them for where they find themselves now because i can tell you from uh, traveling around the centcom region many of the units many of the young people that are attracted to saw are drawn to you know kind of the uh with the the actions that, that you find in in indirect combat uh we uh, recruit and attract people that want to be at the pointy tip of the spear and want to test their metal against an adversary. And it's a good thing that our nation still produces people that, that want to take on those challenges and those hardships. And so I think now, as uh, some of the previous guys have said, it's really about looking where do we go next so that we can kind of redirect our, our talent and our time and resources to where the nation needs us to go next. And so that's kind of kind of where I would start, uh, start in with you. But that's it for now, Jakes. Oh, I, I appreciate it, Bill. Mr. Jeffrey Wright. Hey, uh, good morning, everybody. And, I, and I'd like to just kind of follow up on uh, some of the descriptors that uh, um, that the folks on the on the panel has already brought up and um, listen to Matt as he described uh, kind of a crisis, like um, what he thinks the, the definition of, of crisis is. And in, in line with Ed Crute's paper, uh, did a little bit of research and, and kind of put something together that I'd offer for consideration, you know, for, uh, from my standpoint, uh, crisis being an event or a situation that can arise suddenly uh, or reach a tipping point in its severity that the effect of, uh, uh, has the effect of significantly disrupting lives and threatening the status quo. Um, that may have uh, long-term, potentially harmful consequences on individuals and groups. I know it's a lot to kind of unpack, but it was trying to making a, a broad sense of uh, describing a crisis. And I think it kind of aligns with uh, the sentiment of, of Ed's paper. I'd like to take uh, just a couple minutes, go into to something uh, just to kind of set the stage for, for further discussions here. Um, as, you, uh, as you highlighted from my bio, I've had the uh, the good fortune of being able to, to serve in the military from the Cold War era through the Gulf War into the global war on terror and then hit a couple points in between. Um, and then I think we're going to, um, to see some challenges as we go through um, determining what competing is uh, with respect to great powers. And so this might be a good uh, chance to kind of show that uh, comparison, that doctrinal uh, comparison slide here for the, for the folks at home. But basically, uh, this slide compares uh, the air land battle doctrine to the unified land operations doctrine, which has recently given away to um, multi-domain operations. Uh, the comparison uh, between the two, uh, the air land battle and unified land operations is being compared to the complicated versus the complex. And I'm not trying to take anything away from, uh, from the folks that had to do uh, you know, air land battle. So when you look at those things, you gotta ask, your question, ask the question, why the change? 
one could argue that we went through some type of crisis in between these two examples. And when you look at the air land battle example, it's important to know a couple things. One is we knew the enemy. Uh, we knew their doctrine. We had extensive information on their leaders. We knew their weapons capabilities, their strengths, their weaknesses. And that's what drove the development of the Army's Big Five. Uh, we knew the battle space. Hell, we actually rehearsed on the terrain that we were going to uh, defend. We planned for flots, for FIBAs. Our defenses were uh, linear, contiguous, and in-depth. Our defensive positions were designed for interlocking sectors of fire, mostly observed from adjacent positions. We tailored our actions and responses to a known. Now, when you look at the unified land uh, operations example, we immediately see things have changed. We notice an adjustment to our doctrine. Some of this was due to environmental factors, but I'd offer uh, mostly due to things like policy changes, technological advancements, and the fact that the enemy was no longer known. An example of a policy change with the premise of no boots on the ground. I'm sure uh, many of y'all had lived through that. There were other restrictive policies. Uh, and, and I'd offer uh, those kind of uh, advanced to form a crisis for, for our community for a short time period there. Technological advances were growing at an astounding rate. You're looking at, uh, you know, look at our shoot, move, communicate, survive capabilities, uh, the difference between the Cold War era and unified land operations. I mean, iron sights versus optics, three nods and PEQ twos per squad to the fact that everyone had night vision capability. And we owned the night was the mantra that was often proclaimed. Our communications became digitized, command and control gave away to mission command, ISR became so prevalent that we had to, uh, that we, it was hard to conduct an operation without it. The complexities of warfare for the tactical element were off the chart when compared to the complicated nature of the Cold War era, which brings us to the enemy. The enemy adapted to us, our capabilities and even our policies. Uh, they blended with society easily and oftentimes remained unknown. They fought in ways that did not allow us to unleash our full military capability and were often found in our own camps. Our defenses were no longer continuous and linear. Subordinate leaders uh, are displaced, empowered decision makers that assume prudent risk and rely on trust as the coin of the realm. Long way to get to my point. I use this as an example, as a way to, dis to de uh, demonstrate that I think we have been going through these tipping points or crises or maybe just evolution for a long while now. Uh, one could argue our ability to evolve, innovate, adapt, and maintain flexibility are our core strengths. If we're not evolving, then we're stagnant. And that may be worse than going through a crisis. So in, in summary, I just think that uh, SF and, and our soft writ large has got to find a way to strike a balance between staying relevant, and that's in terms of innovation, evolution, uh, in terms of conditional changes, while at the same time sustaining our core capabilities, doing what only we can do. And, and a lot of that is the indigenous approach with building relationships and trying to impact things before they get to uh, full scale uh, warfare. But I'll, I'll stop there and, and allow others to weigh in. Thanks. Hey, good, good morning, everyone. And, and thanks for the time this morning. You know, I, I, I go back to Matt Williams' uh, definition, and, you know, I agree that there is an identity crisis, but I got to tell you, I'm not worried. You know, I, you know, I, I have this uh, unique, um, this, this great perspective of being able to sit with a lot of leaders and really pick their brains on what's bothering them and then offer advice across a broad spectrum of both military and other leaders. And, and I got to, you know, the things that I, I've learned through this process is that, you know, the, the path forward is not straight. And, and you know, we've, we're a victim of our own capabilities if we are victimized. And, and I think, you know, Special Forces is unique in, in that we have, uh, you know, just wall to wall superior talent. You know, we, we select, uh, train and, and deploy the most capable people on the planet. And I think when you find yourself in an ambiguous situation like we have found through the, the global war on terror, I think you put people in an uncertain environment and they solve the problem. I mean, that's in essence what Green Berets do. And, and so I think through time, you know, what's happened is we've drifted and we've drifted from, and, and in my mind, that crisis is a lack of alignment in not only what we're being asked to do, what the expectations are, and then what the mission sets are. So, and I think this causes disconnects in everything from recruiting to training to, to operational expectations. 
And, you know, the first time that I saw the identity crisis kind of hit me in the face was I was on a rooftop in Hill, Iraq in 03, and I was sitting, uh, I was briefing a senior leader, and uh, the mission was to stabilize uh, the southern provinces in the south, and and I was explaining to that senior leader, you know, what we needed to, in essence, uh, you know, stabilize the local government, uh, build a police force, really get those things that we knew were right. That senior leader looked at me and said, hey, if you want to be in civil affairs, uh, let me know, and I can assign you over there. Um, you know, your job is to kill terrorists. And if you're not ready to do that, uh, you let me know. And so, you know, that conversation didn't go well. Uh, fast forward about 15 years uh, with a group of senior leaders. I uh, was uh, visiting a special forces team room and uh, we asked uh, the, the guys on the team to just give us their background. And uh, one young man very clearly said, hey, I'm here, uh, but I'm not happy. And the question came up, you know, why are you not happy? And he said, well, I joined this group to go to, to get in a gunfight and I'm being asked to go to J sets and, and partner with forces. And it's not what I came here to do. And I think when you look at, um, you know, those two snapshots over a 15 year period, you get to see just kind of how we were pulled in directions. And, and again, I, I think though we're talking about an identity crisis, we're not talking about a capability gap at all. Uh, we've got you know, some of the brightest, most capable people, and we all know and have, have falling and, and been on missions where uh, the requirement was, quote, uh, sprinkle some SS stuff on it and do that thing you do, right? That's the mission set. So um, I think when you, when you put those kind of parameters on folks, they're going to go solve a problem. And whether that means uh, follow me, let's go take down this target or build, you know, a, a host nation force with our, our core set of capabilities of build teams and influence strategic outcomes. I think you know we're gonna we're gonna continue to evolve the force and and we're gonna move forward. So, is there an identity crisis in in the context of Ed Crute's paper? Yes. Uh, are we gonna come out of this just fine? Absolutely. So I'll stop there and uh, let the rest of the panel weigh in. Thank you. All really really good comments, guys, and uh, uh, always learn so much from listening to many different opinions. Uh, listen, first of all, I, I would sit there and say I, I love Ed Crute to death and uh, his whole effort uh, that he's initiated and so forth. I do have a little bit of reservations to the word crisis uh, as, as in, in, in this uh, discussion. Crisis to me are things, and I looked up the definition, it's, it's distress, it's disorder, it's emotionally significant event, it's decisive moment, it requires a critical or is a critical phase, things of this nature, and I don't see it that way at all. I, I, I have a hard time relating our what we are experiencing right now with the word crisis. Uh, I, I talked to many different, uh, some very senior enlisted leaders from the uh, special forces community when they come through the summit course here recently and uh, asked them about that. And, and each and every one of them that I've talked to basically talks about their problem with the word crisis. They don't like the word crisis for, for the exact meaning that uh, I brought up. I look at it this way. I really love the first six words that Ed Crute uses in his definition and a period of uncertainty and confusion. So I would rephrase the question this way and then that's how I'm gonna answer it. Is special forces experiencing a period of uncertainty and confusion related to its mission and or its purpose? That's, a, that's how I'm gonna kind of address that. So I'm gonna go back on, in time just a little bit. You know, the United States uh, military never really officially did unconventional warfare until the OSS stood up. OSS stood up in World War II. They had the Jedbergs, the uh, OG teams, and the uh, Attachment 101s to conduct unconventional warfare, link up with insurgencies, uh, resistance elements, and so forth, uh, deep in enemy held territory, and, and, and fight on behalf of the United States interests. Uh, then at the end of World War II, the OSS was dissolved. The OSS did two things for the United States. One of them was the international intelligence, a gathering, capability, and unconventional warfare. After the OSS was dissolved, the United States no longer had its ability to gather international intelligence or conduct unconventional warfare. That was soon realized shortly after uh, World War II and after the disbanding of the OSS, and then the United States decided to stand up the Central Intelligence Agency in order to make up for that loss of gathering uh, international intelligence. A few years later in 1952, on, on 19 May 1952, Special Forces was activated in order to 
recreate our ability to conduct unconventional warfare, period. That is why Special Forces was established, to conduct unconventional warfare. And that was pretty well understood and accepted for about five years. And then there started being, uh, started uh, the Soviet Union started conducting guerrilla operations in US friendly countries, allies and, and, and partner nations and so forth. And we realized that we needed to counter that. So we started using special forces who are experts at conducting guerrilla operations to start countering guerrilla operations. So starting in the late 50s, the US Special Forces started shifting their focus on countering uh, guerrilla warfare. In 1962, the United States Army produced a special warfare publication. In that special warfare publication, it basically laid out a image on page uh, eight. It showed the Cold War at the top and underneath there, they had a term called special warfare. And that special warfare represented the type of warfare that we are now getting ourselves into. And special warfare back then consisted of three different uh, pillars, counterinsurgency, unconventional warfare, and psychological warfare. Psychological warfare was separate because they understood that psychological warfare applied as much to counterinsurgency operations as it did in unconventional warfare uh, efforts. The publication also showed the United States Army counterinsurgency force consisted of the primary element being a special forces group. And then the illustration shows plus psychological operations, engineer detachments, civil affairs, int intelligence detachments, medical detachments, plus signal, aviation, transportation, or any other organization uh, that uh, the special forces group needed in order to conduct counterinsurgency. That's what the U.S. Army's uh, publication back in 1962 illustrated. In 1967, a few years there, five years later, Special Forces was tagged to be a Special Action Force, a SAF, in FM 3123 stability operations. On 21 November 2070, uh, 1970, SF conducted a Sante raid deep in North Vietnam to rescue American POWs. SF contri contributed tremendously to the Studies and Observation Group, SOG, throughout the Vietnam War with many various covert uh, missions deep into North Vietnam, DA, SR, sabotage, S uh, search and rescue of downed pilots, etc. Later, FID became a uh, hot topic, foreign internal defense. Special Forces were tagged to do an awful lot of foreign internal, internal defense. For years now, we have had Special Forces has had the SIFs, uh, the commanders and extremist force companies. Each group had a company, but their missions were DA, CT, counterterrorism, and hostage rescue. And then you look at SF's contribution to the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq over the last 20 years. So I would tell you that Special Forces has been tasked to do an incredible number of missions over its period of time. Where I think the uncertainty and the confusion comes in, and by the way, I don't believe this is anything new, and I don't think uh, there is a crisis or that there's uncertainty and confusion because we are now shifting to uh, great power competition. I believe this uh, has been going, I would argue that it has been going on for the better part of the last 62 years. I think what's important for special forces to understand thoroughly is why they exist, their core purpose, okay? Why do they exist? to conduct unconventional warfare. And as many of you have pointed out uh, uh, with your answer here to this, this question, uh, special forces have been able to adapt to any other mission set that they're given uh, at any given time. And, and so I don't think there's a crisis. I think there's just a confusion and an uncertainty about what our root core purpose is. And I'll get into the, uh, solving that in, in later discussions. Thank you. Thank you for your insight, sir. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and I want to kind of direct this towards uh, Sergeant Major Waldo in regards to what he sees in the individuals coming in, be it through the 18 X-ray program or from those who are in different MOSs who just want to become special forces and how their views from what the recruiter told them to what they're actually being taught and discussed is shaping the way that 
the perception of the Special Forces Regiment actually is. So any insights you can get on to that, Sergeant Major Waldo? Yeah, I, I guess I'll start from the beginning with me. I joined in, uh, in 97 and, you know, there was no, there's no conflict. And as being born and raised in the first of the 509 Parachute Infantry Regiment, it just seemed like the next great place to contribute to possibly be able to get in a gunfight was, was Special Forces. Didn't know a lot about it. Um, so that, that idea that, man, we're, we're misdirecting folks that want to come in to, to, to get after the direct action sort of operations. Well, that's sort of why I joined, you know, 20 years ago. Saying all that, this new generation of folks, you know, specifically with the 18 x-rays, highly educated, the majority of the folks, very well-rounded, and just the information that they have at their disposal is incredible. They know exactly what they're going into, and this will kind of lead into the next segment a little bit. But they understand this, this, the idea of the indigenous approach of being experts with the, the by, with, and through, and, and basically doing the, uh, being able to handle things from, I guess, disconnected from actually having to do the direct hands-on things. So the guys are getting it, especially the new folks that are standing in the formations out here right off the bus from Fort Benning. They understand what they're getting into. Kind of like General Mark's uh, discussion about, you know, your mission is to go and turn the light on in the, in the garage, but you're blindfolded. You're going to work your way through it. They do have an understanding of the purpose of special forces, from my opinion. Thanks, Jake. Yeah. I actually kind of want to echo that same point, uh, being an x-ray myself. Um, you know, I actually took the time to kind of research and look at what I wanted to do in the military um, as a career. Um, coming out of college, I looked, I looked through, you know, the SEALs. I knew I wanted to do something specialized, special ops type uh, scenario and, and researched everything and, you know, looked at the options that were available to me. Um, and the big ones were, at the time, Marine Force Recon, Navy SEALs, and us, the you know, Special Forces Green Berets. And what drew me to the SF mission set was the kind of the working by with and through the indigenous approach, all that stuff was, was not, was a, I was able to kind of glean that out as their mission set and, and, and capabilities even back then in 2005. So I think, <clears throat> honestly, a lot of the x-rays kind of come in here knowing what they're gonna do. Uh, I think the regular army guys are the kind of the ones that understand like, hey, this is a better place for me to go do like Dave mentioned, to go get in a gunfight and do the other thing. So I think that's kind of where we're disjointed in our recruitment and approach to, and, and our identity in general is, you know, and, and obviously I'm speaking from an ATX ray point of view, and a, not a regular army point of view, but to me, what it looks like in dealing with these guys is x-rays kind of come in with a little bit of a better base understanding of the core tenets of the special forces mission set. Whereas regular army guys are looking to kind of escape their situation, go to the, you know, grass is greener, all I hear about is these dudes getting in gunfights and doing great things. And that's what I want to do. Um, just to kind of throw another point of view on that topic. No, I appreciate that. Um, what about uh, you, Bill? What are your thoughts on the matter? No, I think the guys are really hitting on uh, what we spoke to earlier. And that's, it. you know, the type of people that special forces attracts are kind of drawn to drawn to action. They, they want to stay busy. They want to contribute to the nation's fight. And so if the nation needs them to be direct action combatants, then, then that's what they'll want to do. And I think until, until the scenario around them changes and the leadership guides them to another core task, and I think that's, that's kind of where we, where we find ourselves. But I think you know, in the future with uh, you know, the leadership like General Brennan looking towards uh, great power competition and you know, contest with near peer adversaries, I think the training priorities will shift and bring guys back to, to where they need to go forward. That's kind of the things that uh, Tommy Smith brought up into you know, what, does, what does special forces do? You know, if you're General Clark, if you're the SOCOM commander, you have a lot of capacity in your ranks for direct action. But when you look at some of those nuanced skills that Tommy brought up about unconventional warfare and foreign internal defense, those are core skills that special forces excels at. And I think across SOCOM, that's where special forces will, will kind of make their mark going forward as they have in the past. So I'll kind of toss it back to the group. Um. 
Star Major Friedberg, um, what are your thoughts on the matter coming from a 4th Battalion perspective? Well, I have a lot of thoughts, a lot of interesting stuff. To Sergeant Major Wright, I'm absolutely stealing. We tailored our solutions to knowns. I will try to get, I will try to uh, attribute that to you, but um, I think it was Sergeant Major Waldo that accurately tied our lineage to the Office of Strategic Services, not the first special service force, right? Like you can only climb the face of Monte Casino so many times until you lose 88% of your guys and then just get disaggregated to the rest of the formation. I think both branches of the OSS, whether it was special operations or secret intelligence, um, with the exception of the requisite unilateral reconnaissance missions that um, CSM Smith mentioned, like we did in McAfee SOG, require partners. We require partners. So I, I don't want to get into a doctrinal discussion, but I think what we do, in addition to develop uh, underground auxiliary and guerrilla forces, we use surrogates to provide one or more of the four warfighting functions when they're not available or feasible. Period. We could get bolted on to 7th ID tomorrow and they could turn around and say, what can those three ODAs do? And then that company and battalion commander could turn around and say, we can give you X amount of partner force infantry capacity, or we could we could allow you to re reposition one of your infantry companies because we can start a protest in this one town. I think it's just the surrogates, the indigenous infrastructure, it's the the folks on the ground that are providing those warfighting functions, whether they're uniformed or not, that is necessarily the purpose of what we do. I, I would also argue that part of our identity is decentralization. If you've got a company from 7th Group that's being asked to go down to Columbia, and you've got a company from 10th Group that's going to Ukraine, it's going to seem like we have a bit of an identity crisis from a mission perspective, but that's why we have METs, that why, that's why we have you know group training management systems. So I think part of our identity has to be decentralization and back to CSM Waldo again, with that many, with that many core competencies, of course, it's going to seem like what, you know, the left hand is doing one thing while the right hand is doing another. I, I would also say as leaders, both current, past and future, we have to remind people that as we lift and shift to a new direction and a new focus, it does not take away from the achievement and the sacrifices of the past. And I think there's a lot of people that feel like as we get into the competition space and we look more towards China and Russia's adversaries and less toward VEOs, it's somehow taking away from what they've done in the past at great personal and professional cost. And I think we have to be very, very careful to legitimize what people have done in the past and sort of usher them into the future. I think people are naturally going to be sensitive about being told, hey, we need to leave you know, 2000 and you know, we need to leave September 12, 2001, all the way to the publication of the NDS in two, 2016 in the rearview mirror, it belongs in a museum. That's not true, we need to carry that forward, but we also need to make sure that we are taking the regiment in the right direction. I would also say the identity crisis, we could argue semantics all day, but I would say it is a crisis if our source, if our formation is not man tripped in a, or man trained and equipped to accomplish the missions that the TSOCs assign us. So if we have a whole bunch of people that not just want to do DA, but unilateral DA and bring along a handful of perfunctory partners so they can get the CONOP approved, I think now we are approaching the crisis space. And, you know, if I'm standing next to a local that's got a bed sheet full of water bottles and an ill-fitting helmet and I have a partner force with me, that's not what we were being put on the ground to do. We were being put on the ground to lead these guys on the X, maybe do a couple of raids on phone booths as a confidence target, but get back to being able to leave the battle space a little bit better than we found it. Um, just a couple of more things. Training to the demand, not the desire. Put a different way, we have to fight the war we have, not the war we want. Like, I know we don't do phases anymore, but are we doing phase five in an OD DAC environment instead of phase zero? If you ask an ambassador, we're enabling civil authority by bringing in all these different security cooperation OAIs, strengthening the host nation military and our partnership. I think we need to look at what phase are we in? We tend to gravitate towards phase zero and phase three when we have a lot of strategic uh, utilization in phase five. Um, another thing, another big element in the room is we create this Viking culture and then our guys do Viking stuff that we don't like. And the derivative of that are some ethical missteps we've made in the past. I wrote my Josofsky capstone paper on a culture of ethical decision-making and you create a sense of 
you know, you're recreating Genghis Khan's mentality, but then you don't like what people do to the villages, either when they're overseas or in the back. And I think as we recreate our culture, we recreate our identity. I think those are some things that we need to address. And then I would say very much the last thing is um, I really liked CSM um, Smith's timeline, but I think another enormous thing is 1987 when they talked about Nun Cohen, which created the CJTF, right? Or the Counterterrorism Joint Task Force, but it also created theater soft as sort of low intensity conflict. So if you go back to 87, our current bloodstream is actually low intensity conflict and all that comes with that. And it's super hard to quantify, it's super hard to train for, um, but also, us as a regiment supporting the TSOX and that decentralization, I think there are some challenges there. But I think we do need to take a close look in the mirror and say, true or false, we can accomplish every single one of our assigned missions from a regionally aligned perspective. And is the answer an unequivocal yes? And if the answer is not yes, then we have to approach the notion that maybe we do have a crisis if we're not prepared to conduct our missions. I sort of opened that last one up to the group. I, I do have some low vis body armor on under this shirt. So I'm more than I'm looking forward to some heat rounds. Yeah, I'd like to chime in here real quick if I if I may. Dave, uh, great comments. They, they really, really work. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address two things. One, OK, so you talked about the timeline. You had an appreciation for the timeline. I, th I think some that people don't really understand is how this timeline unfolded over a period of time. So we started out with special warfare, which I covered with the uh, with what the United States Army called uh, special warfare at the time, with the three pillars: uh, counterinsurgency, uh, unconventional uh, warfare, and psychological operations. That was that. After the end of the World War, uh, I mean uh, the Vietnam War, that term basically went away, and, and the various uh, mission sets or or activities that were covered underneath that ended up falling into what they ended up calling special uh, or low intensity conflict. Okay. That lasted for a period of time, which they no longer liked that term. And they came up with a new term, military operations short of war. That term lasted a very, very short time because it was short of war, yet there was emergency uh, uh, missions in there that would be performed in the United States itself. So people were offended by short of war. So you're gonna be doing things short of war here in the United States. So then they changed the title to military operations other than war, Mutwa, okay? And Mutwa, the last manual that had Mutwa in there was produced in 2000, okay? What happened after 2000, 9-11, okay? Mutwa, you haven't heard of Mutwa forever since then. What was a new term that came up? The new term that uh, that was uh, came up uh, very shortly thereafter was global war on terror, okay, and that that sort of drove us for a while, and then of course the reality set in that we're dealing with a lot of insurgencies here, and we have to uh, do counterinsurgency, all right, and and they were very very frustrated over that type of a warfare. They sat there in in the tank, and somebody sat there and said, "This is totally irregular. This is not regular warfare," and that's where the term irregular warfare came from. Right there in the tank, somebody came up with the term irregular warfare. And if you look at irregular warfare, it has five pillars. Unconventional warfare, counterinsurgency, foreign internal defense, stability operations, and counterterrorism. And I always show it this way because one opposes the thumb, opposes the fingers. This is unconventional warfare. It is against the government. And these four items here are for the government, which opposes the uh, unconventional warfare. So that, that just brings us all the way to where we're at today. And I'm waiting for the day where the term irregular warfare is going to go away. Nobody's going to use it anymore. It's going to be forgotten. I know that we have an irregular warfare annex to the national defense strategy uh, that they're really trying to push. And the biggest pushback is coming from the four services that are wanting to focus on uh, great power competition and not on irregular warfare any longer. So they're trying to get rid of that as they did uh, special warfare back in the day. Yeah, I think um, I mean, just I filled up a page with a bunch of notes from uh, from the comments uh, from the team here, and I, and uh, just thankful to be part of this because it's an education process for me as well. I think uh, when you start looking at um, you know from a broader perspective, you know, and how how Tommy lays out uh, the timeline there, um, I 
I think we have experienced this type of, you know, I'll just, I'll just use the term crisis because it's uh, part of the theme here, in between a lot of these jumping off points or transition points. And so if you have, you know, folks coming back from World War II, uh, where they come home to, what was, um, you know, what drove them after, you know, near, nearly four years of war for some of them. Uh, same thing with, with uh, post-Vietnam uh, War era, you know, even even the Gulf War where we had, you know, one point something million people kind of mobilized and then what happened to them after, you know, uh, we kind of, you know, transitioned from that to other things. And, and so you can take a look at, um, you know, where we've been on the deployment train now for, for nearly 18, 19 years for some folks. Um, and then when you transition into something like great powers competition and you look at your role in great powers competition, which is more of a, in, in most cases, a supporting role, you know, diplomacy or economy or information is the lead and the, the military aspect, um, you know, not called to open warfare is going to be in a supporting role. And from somebody coming into from a uh, global war on terror where you are the predominant uh, tool there in the CENTCOM AOR and AFRICOM AOR and some other places, it's going to be a hard transition to make. And one of the things that I was looking at uh, the term crisis, you know, and, and how does one survive or, or come out of crisis with some positive attributes to it, a lot of it was related to time. Um, you know, and so when you have the time to transition from one aspect of what you're doing to another aspect, uh, that stress that you get in transition is not as prominent as if you have to turn on a dime and go from one to another and you're forced to evolve without using your normal resourcing or processes. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, the a, a notice signs where our uh, federal government was already making that turn to great powers competition. And then when you look at a hey, SOCOM, you're still doing, you know, number five, you know, the counter BEO piece don't come off the gas on that, but the rest of us are now moving over into, you know, Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran, and then you know, you'll have time to transition and come on over. So, so I think that, um, you know, you look at the marketing videos uh, for recruiting, and it's all about free fall operations, running and gunning on vehicles, shooting people in CQB. And it was the first one I saw a couple of weeks ago. I don't watch a lot of TV, but saw the ad where somebody was actually uh, advertising you know, someone to join the cyber war, and uh, which was really kind of unique, uh, you know, given where we're at today. So I just say that you know one of the things that we've got to do is. Um, when, uh, when looking at that stress and uh, from from a, a identity crisis about what we're doing, it's kind of realize, hey, how much time do we have? Uh, what are the resources we have? And what are our role uh, that we're going to do? And it's a um, I've always looked at it as leadership, you know, or, or higher headquarters is what drives change. Innovation comes best from the bottom up, uh, and the reason why change is. Um, you know, is, is, is meaningful change is driven from the top, from the command level is because they have a vision, they know where it is, uh, the organization is going to go and they have the resources to move it that way. If we try to drive change in the bottom, we're not in control of the resources that, that drive that change, but the, but the command is. So folks uh, like uh, General Brennan, like General Bodet, kind of put the vision out there. They move the resources to get things going. Uh, the leadership uh, puts that information up and out and down and in, and then we uh, react to, you know, that um, transition, you know, uh, if uh, our identity, you know, appropriately. So um, do not disagree with, uh, with a lot of the comments that were already made. And as a matter of fact, I uh, really like the, the variation in there. And I'll turn it back over to the team. Yeah, if I can chime in real quick, it, it, it dawned on me what the point was that I was going to make uh, my second point a little bit ago. You know, when I was a uh, U.S. OCOM CSM uh, on the 25th of August 2008, uh, U.S. OCOM published the U.S. OCOM Directive number 10-1 right here. When I started going through it, it uh, okay, so what it is, is the terms of reference, roles, missions, and functions of component commands. And what it basically does is lists every mission that is assigned to US OCOM. And US OCOM then through this directive broke down and assigned all of those different missions to various component commands and then broke it down. What I ended up doing was going down because it sort of caught me uh, off guard of what I was reading in it. And I went through it word for word. What I ended up doing then was coming up with a list like this. And what I basically did was listed down every one of the missions that were in 
the man uh, or in this directive all the way top all the way down to the bottom on the right hand side i included each column for usasoc afsoc warcom and marsoc and at the end of the day what i found was every tribe within special operations command every one of them had a unique mission set that was assigned to them it was their purpose it was their core purpose for existing it didn't mean that they didn't contribute to other things they absolutely did there was only one organization in the entire special operations community that did not have its own unique core purpose, special forces. That's the only one. Special forces Green Berets did not have a core purpose that belonged to them in this entire directive. And uh, so I, that's, and that is why I sit there and stress so hard, why did we exist? Why did we get stood up and activated in, in uh, 1952? to conduct unconventional warfare. That is our core purpose as special forces. Okay, it does not mean that we're limited to that. Heavens no. It makes us extremely, extremely capable to do all the many other things that special forces have done over the years. That's what I wanted to say, thank you. Yeah, I tell you, I'm, I'm uh, learning a lot today, so it's fantastic. Um, so, uh, you know, one, you know, I think it's, it's really impressive that uh, that the command is is really kind of opening the aperture to have a discussion about all of this and really continuing the podcast series and and, and really focus on it. I think as as any organization, you know, determining where you are, uh, where you're going, and how you're going to get there, uh, just just vital. And I think the points made today are extremely enlightening for one and two. I think really point to some of those things that the command is going to have to look at as we move forward. You know, one as Tom Smith said, you know, what is the what is our purpose and and where where you know what's the, the core of what we're doing. And as, as was, as was mentioned earlier, you know, that ability, that, that critical analysis of, you know, we've got a lot of mission sets that, that, that are listed for us. Uh, can we accomplish those? And can we accomplish those in, in all of the environments we're asked to do them? And I think that analysis is, is vital to be able to focus on, you know, what the solution set looks like. And I know we're going to talk solution sets in the future, but you know, what, what's very clear here is that, you know, one, you've got a, an incredible talent of, of leaders who are, we're focused on the problem, and two, that you know the this uh, the the ability to actually explore this crisis, if you, if it's labeled that way, uh, to explore the crisis and then look for you know to really collaborate on and point to where we're headed, just extraordinary. I mean, just extraordinary for a command to do that uh, at any level, and it's unheard of in my time that you know any any command would really be this transparent with uh, a challenge they're facing and really just open it up for discussion. So. With that being said, uh, just an extraordinary lesson learned for me and uh, really, really happy to continue this discussion on the next uh, next cast. Thank you, gentlemen, for all your insights. And I ask everyone to continue listening. So as we continue this discussion in our next episode with how does this affect the force? Thank you for listening. This has been the Indigenous Approach. We hope you have enjoyed this episode. Follow us on social media. And if you have suggestions for topics or guests, Send us a message. Thank you for listening.